So it's a delight to welcome Susan Orlean to the Free Library, a New Yorker staff writer for almost 30 years. Orlean can weave an engrossing story out of even the most familiar threads. Her sweeping curiosity has taken around the world to report on Little League baseball whales, taxi drivers, matadors, debutantes, and more, resulting in dozens of magazine articles and eight books, including the New York Times bestseller, The Orchid Thief. Her most recent volume is The Library Book, which is a poignant investigation of the 1986 Los Angeles Public Library uh, fire. The Guardian called it a, an homage to those whose lives are transformed by these public palaces of reading on both sides of the lending desk. We're so pleased that she's here to discuss it with us this evening. Please join me in welcoming Susan Orlean to the Free Library. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. And I know you're not here just because it's warm, <laughs> right? At least that's what I'm telling myself. I, I'm really thrilled to be here and I wanna thank you all and thank the library for hosting me and making this stop um, on my, what feels like a never ending book tour, but in the best way. I was just actually reminiscing with Andy, who runs this series, and um, talking about the last time I was here, which was in um, 2011, with Rinton Tin. And I actually have a nice story to tell about that, which is that um, there was a woman who I knew slightly who interviewed me on stage, and she and I became incredibly good friends, and she's one of my best friends. and. Uh, so it all happens in the library. <laughs> so I wanna to talk to you a little bit tonight about how I came to write this book and what it meant to me beyond the journalistic curiosity of, of what libraries all, are all about. So I wanna begin by just reading a short section from the beginning of the book. I grew up in libraries or at least it feels that way. I was raised in the suburbs of Cleveland, just a few blocks from the brick-faced Bertram Woods branch of the Shaker Heights Public Library System. Throughout my childhood, starting when I was very young, I went there several times a week with my mother. On those visits, my mother and I walked in together, but as soon as we passed through the door, we split up and each headed to our favorite section. The library might have been the first place I was ever given autonomy. Even when I was maybe four or five years old, I was allowed to head off on my own. Then after a while, my mother and I reunited at the checkout counter with our finds. Together, we waited as the librarian at the counter pulled out the date card and stamped it with the checkout machine that giant fist thumping the card with a loud chunk chunk, printing a crooked due date underneath a score of previous crooked due dates that belong to other people, other times. Our visits to the library were never long enough for me. The place was so bountiful. I love wandering around the bookshelves, scanning the spines until something happened to catch my eye. Those visits were dreamy, frictionless interludes that promised I would leave richer than I arrived. It wasn't like going to a store with my mom, which guaranteed a tug of war between what I wanted and what my mother was willing to buy me. In the library, I could have anything I wanted. After we checked out, I loved being in the car and having all the books we'd gotten stacked on my lap pressing me under their solid, warm weight, their mylar covers sticking a bit to my thighs. It was such a thrill leaving a place with things you hadn't paid for. <laughs> such a thrill anticipating the new books we would read. On the ride home, my mom and I talked about the order in which we were gonna read our books and how long until they had to be returned a solemn conversation in which we decided how to pace ourselves through this charmed, evanescent period of grace until the books were due. 
We both thought all of the librarians at the Bertram Woods Branch Library were beautiful. For a few minutes, we would discuss their beauty. My mother then always mentioned that if she could have chosen any profession at all, she would have chosen to be a librarian. And the car would grow silent for a moment as we both considered what an amazing thing that would have been. When I was older, I usually walked to the library myself, lugging back as many books as I could carry. Even when I was in my last year of high school and could drive myself to the library, my mother and I still went together now and then, and the trip unfolded exactly as it did when I was a child, with the same beats and pauses and comments and reveries, the same perfect pensive rhythm we followed so many times before. When I miss my mother these days, now that she is gone, I like to picture us in the car together, going for one more magnificent trip to Bertram Woods. Thank you. Thank you. So let me tell you the journey of coming to do this book, because it was a little bit unusual. The fact of the matter is, after I finished Rin Tin Tin, I decided that I was not gonna write any more books. I, I knew I still wanted to be a writer, I was happy to write magazine stories, but I just didn't want to make the kind of commitment that a book requires. Rin Tin Tin took me six years, and I thought, I just don't wanna do that anymore. I also actually thought that I couldn't, I, I couldn't imagine finding a story that interested me enough to make that kind of commitment. So I just made this, made peace with this decision. I wasn't gonna write any more books. And one day I was in the library and I just had a moment where I sort of looked around, I must have overheard something, and I thought, you know, I've been in libraries so many times in my life but I actually have no idea how they operate. I, I don't know what the day-to-day -day life of a library is like. And I thought, you know, that would make a really interesting book. <laughs> and I thought, but not for me. I'm, I'm not writing it, but that's a, it's a good idea for a book. So I filed it away. Shortly after that, my husband and I moved to Los Angeles, and my son was entering first grade. We were brand new to the city, and after his first couple of days at school, he had an assignment, and the assignment was to talk to someone who worked for the city. So he came to me, told me he had this assignment, and I thought, well, a little five-year-old boy, I said, why don't you interview a garbage collector? And he sized me up, <laughs> and he said, how about if I interview a librarian? And I thought, I am such a good mother. <laughs> so we decided to go to the library, and we were so new to the city, we didn't even know where the nearest branch was, so we looked it up, and I loaded him into the car, and we headed over there. On the way, I, I had this fleeting notion that, <clears throat> excuse me, that the branch library in LA was just about the same distance from our house as the Bertram Woods Branch Library had been from my house my childhood home. And I just thought, oh, that's interesting, just kind of the same length of the journey. We got to the library, and from the outside, it doesn't look anything like the library in Cleveland, but the minute we walked in the door, there was something about the smell of the place, the sound, the feel of it, that reminded me exactly of the Bertram Woods Library. And it was the most powerful 
sensation of memory flooding back to me. I hadn't really thought about those trips with my mom in years. I, I simply didn't think about them very much. And suddenly, they were as vivid as, the, as if they had just occurred. And I was truly overwhelmed by, by this profound recollection of those many, many trips with my mom. My first thought was why would those experiences with my mother be so memorable? I went lots of places with my mother. And I, I don't walk into grocery stores and find myself overwhelmed <laughs> with emotion. I don't, you know, it, it just, this was so particular to the library. I thought, what is it about libraries that bring out such a strong reaction, such potent memories, such deep emotional connections? I thought someone should write a book about that, <laughs> but not me. So right around that time, I was approached by the head of the Library Foundation in Los Angeles, who asked if I would give a talk to their donors. I said, of course, I'm happy to do it. And the, it was a luncheon. The lunch was held at some country club in, in Los Angeles, and I gave my talk. And when I was done, the head of the foundation, who's a man named Ken Brecker, um, said that as a thank you, he wanted to give me a tour of the downtown library. And I was really excited because I didn't know LA had a downtown. <laughs> so we met a few days later in this imaginary place. And before I even got to the building, I was kind of struck. I mean, the LA Central Library doesn't look anything like this library. It doesn't look like the New York Public Library. It doesn't look like any of the, the libraries that we think of in big cities, this sort of temple of knowledge. It's a very eccentric building. It looks a little as if the architect had fallen asleep with a book about King Tut and a book about Art Deco under his pillow and then woke up and drew the building. And as I got closer, I also noticed that all around the facade of the building were carvings of quotes from throughout history about knowledge, about books, about learning. It was as if the building was a book that you could read as you walked around it. And I, I just really flipped. I thought, this is an amazing building. So we went inside, and Ken began telling me all about the history of the building and all of the fascinating characters who had had a part in its history. And more and more, I was just thinking, this place is amazing, just remarkable. We got to the fiction department, and he stopped in front of the bookshelf, and he pulled a book off, and he held it up. He took a deep whiff of the book. And I stood there rather awkwardly, and I thought, I'm... I'm new to LA, I don't know, <laughs> like, do I smell the book? Or do I, maybe I take a different book and smell it? I, I, I just kind of stood there for a moment. And he said to me, you know, you can still smell the smoke in some of them. I said, did they used to let people smoke in the library? And he said, no, smoke from the fire. I said, what fire? And he said, well, from the big fire, the fire in 1986. I said, I don't know what you're talking about. He said, well, the big fire in 86, it closed the library for seven years. And as he 
headed off to show me something else, I thought, boy, someone should write a book about that. <laughs> so let me quickly read to you a, a, a very short bit from the book and then tell you a little more about this fire. At first, the smoke in the fiction stacks was as pale as onion skin. Then it deepened to dove gray. Then it turned black. It wound around fiction A through L, curling in lazy ringlets. It gathered into soft puffs that bobbed and banked against the shelves like bumper cars. Suddenly, sharp fingers of flame shot through the smoke and jabbed upward. More flames erupted. The heat built. The temperature reached 451 degrees, and the books began smoldering. Their covers burst like popcorn. Pages flared and blackened and then sprang away from their bindings, a ream of sooty scraps soaring on the updraft. The fire flashed through fiction, consuming as it traveled. It reached for the cookbooks. The cookbooks roasted. The fire scrambled to the sixth tier and then to the seventh. Every book in its path bloomed with flame. So the first thing that I learned, because as soon as I came home, I thought I need to find out what he was referring to. This was a fire that took place in April 1986, and it was the largest library fire in American history. It burned for seven and a half hours, and at, at its fiercest, the temperature inside the building reached 2,000 degrees. So not only were the books burning, but the metal shelving was melting. When it finally was put out after seven and a half hours of literally every firefighter in the city of LA working on it, it was discovered that 400,000 books had been destroyed and 700,000 were damaged. So it was a, a catastrophic fire. In fact, until very recently, it was not only was it the largest library fire in American history, it was the largest structural fire in Los Angeles history. So my first question was, how did I never hear about this? This, this is a significant event in a big city, how did I not hear about it? Now, I was living in New York at the time of the fire, and I thought, I can't imagine that the New York Times wouldn't have covered this. So the first thing I did was go to the New York Times archives and look up April 29th, 1986, because I thought, I want to know what, whether they covered this at all and what else was going on that could have possibly distracted us from this story. So I type in the date and the New York Times comes up on my computer screen and the headline on the front page was, Soviets deny meltdown at Chernobyl nuclear plant. So the first part of the mystery was solved, which was I found the story about the fire in the New York Times, but it was pushed way back in the front section. And almost the entire rest of the front section was about Chernobyl. So that was the first piece of this that I understood. But the second part of it was what happened? Well, very soon after the fire was finally extinguished, the fire department made a statement that it was arson. So my question was, who would burn a library down? And what happened in the investigation? So the book began with these very different impulses. One was just this curiosity about how do, how do libraries work 
and how do they function day to day? What's it like in a library day to day? The second one was this emotional piece. Why do we care so much about libraries? Because I think that's universally true. But that emotional reaction I had remembering visiting the library with my mother, I thought, I don't think that's unique to me. I think we have powerful feelings about libraries that go beyond the very specific, tangible essence of a library. It's a place full of books, but we feel much more than that. But thirdly was this question of who burn the library down and why. So the story unfolded to me quickly and the pursuit of a young man named Harry Peake who, like many people in Los Angeles, was a failed actor and how he got tangled up in the story of the library fire and became the prime suspect and the focus of the investigation. Now, one thing that was interesting to me was when I heard about the library burning, I thought, well, I know the library in Alexandria burned, but this has to be an isolated incident. And alas, that is not at all true. Libraries have been burned since they've been built. And it was really quite staggering to go back and begin doing research on the unfortunately vast history of burn libraries. It, it, it is almost inconceivable how many libraries in the history of human civilization have been burned. Some are just, you know, they're places filled with flammable things, but many of them have been targeted and there's been a specific campaign to burn the library. In fact, in World War II, which was the single most destructive event in the history of planet Earth for books and libraries, the Nazis actually had a specific commando unit that had one task, and that was to seek out and burn libraries. Now, I thought, when I learned about this, I thought that seems like a very strange use of manpower. I mean, burning a library wouldn't seem to be a good strategic move if you're trying to win a war. Why would you do it? And it actually brought me back to the second part of this three-part question, which is you burn libraries down because people care about them. And it fills people with horror, with dread, and with despair when they see a library burn. But even more than that, it's, a, it's almost a message and a warning that your community, your culture, will be erased and that your books go first. In fact, um, a German philosopher made the rather chilling remark that where they burn books, next they burn people. And I would say if you look over the course of human history, there's rarely been an instance where a regime burned books where they didn't then erase people as well. That just reinforced this feeling that I had that we, we have a connection to libraries that really goes beyond the, the simply rational. It's something deeper than that. When I was working on the book, I came across an expression that I found very puzzling but interesting. So I wrote it down on an index card and I had it hanging over my desk for much of the time I was working on the book. And it's an expression from Senegal where when someone dies, you say his or her library has burned. And when I read this, I thought that's a kind of an odd expression. Like, how do you equate someone's death with a library burning? But I, I found it sort of evocative, so I kept it hanging over my desk. 
When I first started working on the book, I, um, of course, told my mom. And like any good mother, she took credit for it. And she said, you know, I think I'm the one who got you interested in libraries. And, you know, basically, I'm responsible for you doing this book. And, you know, I said, you're absolutely right. It's your book. And not long after I began working on the book, my mom was diagnosed with dementia. And over the next period of time, every time I saw her, her memory was eroding. And suddenly I had this vision of her, her memory being a sort of library filled with volumes, each of which had a memory, a piece of knowledge, a fact, a vignette, a story, a dream, something that made her who she is, and each of them were disappearing. It also occurred to me for the first time that a library is, in a sense, a communal mind, and all of the knowledge and fantasies and dreams and stories and facts that a society possesses are collected in a library. And when a library burns, it's as if all of us lose something of our communal mind. So that was the underpinning of the book for me, was this, this question of our connection to these places, the sort of human quality that libraries seem to have and why we would feel such a deep loss when a library burns. Now, one of the things I, I followed was the story of Harry Peake, this young man who was accused of setting the fire. And unexpectedly, s learning the story of Harry Peake was also, for me, a kind of primer on how not to be a criminal, which I feel was um, kind of a bonus in doing the book. For instance, how did Harry Peake become a suspect? Well, he began telling everybody he, he started the fire. <laughs> so, you know, number one, don't tell people you did a crime. Secondly, he had not one, not two, but seven alibis. So in my, you know, quick education on how to be a felon, I. I learned that it's good to have one alibi <laughs> and not seven. And I don't want to, for those of you who haven't read the book, I, I don't want to, you know, there is an element of, of suspense and, and the unfolding of the story. So I, I don't want to tell you too many details. But it was, a, it, it was a fascinating, incredibly convoluted investigation that, that revealed a lot to me about, about all of the elements here, about the story of LA, because I was new to LA when I began the book, and I was sort of learning the story of the city, as well as the incredible complexity of investigating arson. Um, when I began the book, my publisher said to me, so you're, you're gonna solve the crime, right? And you know, you're sitting with your publisher trying to get a book deal. I said, yes, of course I am. And, you know, I learned soon thereafter that arson is the least successfully prosecuted of all major crime. So it, I thought, yeah, I'm going to solve that. Um, yeah, it only happened 30 years ago, but I'm, I've nailed this. I'm going to get it. But it, was, it actually was a fascinating thing and an extremely complicated issue about the investigation of arson in general. And that unfolded in a way that I could never have expected. One of the th other 
uh, aspects that I hadn't anticipated really becoming engaged with was, I knew I would write about the history of the LA Library, but I hadn't expected to become so engrossed in it, and particularly in the story of the various people who have been the city librarian of Los Angeles. And I, I came to the conclusion that, and I say this in the most loving way, that libraries attract unusual <laughs> people to their staff. And then I will also say in a very loving way that Los Angeles attracts <laughs> a lot of very unusual people. So the overlap between people who are attracted to working in a library in Los Angeles is, you know, they're sort of doubly determined to be unusual. And LA had some remarkable people running the library starting at the turn of the century when the library was founded. It had some particularly distinctive people and some qualities that were unexpected. For instance, the first city librarian was a 17-year-old girl. <laughs> Women were not allowed in the library at that time, which makes the fact that she was running the library particularly unusual. I mean, she was so young, her dad would walk her to work. My personal favorite was a man who took over the library just around 1905. He was a man named Charles Lummis, and he was um, eccentric. He had been a journalist in living in Cincinnati, and he was offered a job by the LA Times, and this was around 1898. And, you know, they approached him. He was there in Cincinnati, and he thought, well, I'm, I'm going to take that job. So he packed up his belongings and walked to Los Angeles, <laughs> as one does. I mean, every now and again, I think about it. You know, walking from Cincinnati to Los Angeles, even now, would be unusual. <laughs> but, you know, in 1898, it was super unusual. And he was, he was a real eccentric. He was a genius, so I don't want to um, make it sound as if he was just a, a, a sort of ridiculous person. He was a very... He was a brilliant man, a real visionary, but he, he was definitely eccentric. Um, for instance, he, he couldn't stand when people read books that he thought were stupid. So rather than taking those books off the shelf because he didn't believe in censorship, he had a branding iron made with a skull and crossbones and he branded the books that he thought were particularly stupid <laughs> and then put a bookmark in it saying there are far better books on this subject. <laughs> you know, but left them on the shelf. And his whole saga at the LA Library wa was extraordinary. And there was a point where I became so engrossed in his, his life, which was absolutely fascinating, that I began thinking I should just abandon the book and just do a biography of Charles Lummis. Um, just one more note about one of his talents is he, he had um, dozens and dozens of extramarital affairs. And I don't know that's a talent, let me think of that in a different way. Um, and he kept a detailed journal of each of his assignations with his various lovers, but he kept the journal in Spanish. <laughs> Somehow, I think, convincing himself that it, this would keep it private, but his wife spoke Spanish. <laughs> So they had actually had one of the more notable divorce proceedings in the history of L.A. up until recently. 
Um, when I was working on the book, I, I got to a point when I was, I, uh, the way I work is I do all of my reporting first. And then I do, when I feel that I've really come to know the story, I start writing. So there's a very long, long time where I'm just out doing my research, spending time at the library, reading material. And then I get to a point where in my gut, I think I really know the story now. I'm ready to write. So I had gotten to that point and I was in the library for one last trip there. And I was chatting with one of the librarians and I said to her, you know, with this great confidence, I said, you know, I, I kind of know everything now. And so you, you're not going to see me for a while because I'm now, I'm going to just be at home writing. And she said, oh, that's great. She said, she paused for a minute and then she said, did you ever look in the back corner of the rare book room? I think there are some boxes back there. And I, I said, N no. And she said, yeah, well, you know what, look, wait a minute, let me, I'm, I'm gonna go look for you. And I thought, no. <laughs> and she said, no, no, seriously, wait. And she took off. I stood there, and I'd been reporting at that point for three years. So, you know, and I thought, I, I nailed this. I know this. And I thought, I, I, don't, I don't want any more material. And I stood there and I thought I could just leave. But I, I kind of hesitated. And after a few minutes, the librarian emerged and she looked really happy, which disturbed me. <laughs> and she said, I knew it. And I, I just knew there was stuff back there. And there was a clerk who was hauling a cart and she said, there are 76 boxes of material back there. We just brought you a few. And I said, oh, great. That's fantastic. And two years later, <laughs> when I finished going through the boxes, and I have to say, of course I was thrilled, kind of. Um, but what was in these boxes was this wealth of material that the librarians had collected from the beginning of the library's history. Newspaper clips, you know, flotsam and jetsam, book lists, just everything imaginable. It was, it was really quite amazing. And one of the things that was in there that I loved was um, I didn't, I had no idea that these existed, which is, you know, the library is one of their chief functions and it continues to this day is to answer calls from people with questions. And even today with Google being on everybody's phone, there are still people calling the library all the time with questions. But certainly before Google, it was the place that you called when you had a question. And LA had a very robust reference desk with lots and lots of librarians answering the phone, partly because as the libraries on the East Coast closed for the day, everyone on the East Coast began calling the West Coast with their questions. One thing I didn't know is that until the library actually made a ruling to not permit it, people would call all the time to have librarians help them solve crossword puzzle clues. <laughs> and they, they got so many calls for this that the library finally just made it a policy that they would not answer crossword puzzle questions. But I loved seeing, the, the librarians kept a log of all the questions. And I found these logs in, in these boxes that came out of the deep depths of the rare book room. And I, I just loved reading them because they were so random and it was so fascinating to see what people were thinking about at whatever odd 
question they had at any given moment. So I just want to read a few of them to you because I, I just love these. Um, these were from the mid-1960s. So these were questions that people called into the library. Patron call. Wanted to know how to say, the necktie is in the bathtub in Swedish. <laughs> Patron call asking for a book on liver disorders for her husband, who is a heavy drinker. Patron call asking whether it is necessary to rise if national anthem is played on radio or television. <laughs> Explain that one need only do what is natural and unforced. For instance, one does not rise while bathing, eating, or playing cards. <laughs> Patron is a writer in Hebrew, wanted to create a pun between the word for Zion and the word for penis. We couldn't find a Hebrew word for penis, but the term copulate is mitzayan, which helped her make a pun. Patron inquiring whether Perry Mason's secretary, Della Street, is named after a street, <laughs> and or whether there is a real street named Della Street. <laughs> and I have to redo this last one, even though a lot of people find this depressing. I find it heartening because it really is to me, a sign of how, number one, you can get anything you want from the library, but secondly, that we feel this sort of intimacy with libraries that's really very special, which is patron called asking for help writing inscription for father's tombstone. I think it's kind of great, I do. Um, I know we need to leave time for questions, and I could go on forever, I'm, I wish, I wish I could because it's it's such an honor to be here and I I'm really honored to be the the person representing this lecture series today so thank you kindly for for this really quite a wonderful honor I appreciate it and <laughs> Um, I think what I'll do is I'm just going to read one last little section from the end of the book, and then we'll open it up to questions. And thank you so much for being here. Such a nice evening. Thanks. I went to the library late one day, just before closing time, when the light outside was already dusky and the place was sleepy and slow. The library is so big that when the crowds thin out, it can feel very private, almost like a secret place. And the space is so enveloping that you have no sense of the world outside. I went down to the history department, and then I roamed from department to department, just strolling through, and crossed the beautiful hollow rotunda, a gorgeous surprise every time I entered it, and then went up the wide lap of the back staircase. The silence was more soothing than solemn. A library is a good place to soften solitude, a place where you feel part of a conversation that has gone on for hundreds and hundreds of years, even when you're all alone. The library is a whispering post. You don't need to take a book off a shelf to know there is a voice inside that is waiting to speak to you. And behind that was someone who truly believed that if he or she spoke, someone would listen. It was that affirmation that always amazed me. Even the oddest, most particular book was written with that kind of courage. The writer's belief that someone would find his or her book important to read. I was struck by how precious and brave that belief is and how necessary and how full of hope it is to collect these books and manuscripts and preserve them. It declares that all of these stories matter, and so does every effort to create something that connects us to one another and to our past and to what is still to come. I realize that this entire time, 
I had been convincing myself that my hope to tell a long-lasting story, to be alive somehow as long as someone would read my books, was what drove me on, story after story. It was my lifeline, my passion, my way to understand who I was. I thought about my mother, who died when I was halfway done with this book, and I knew how pleased she would have been to see me in the library. And I was able to use that thought to transport myself for a split second to a time when I was young and she was in the moment, alert and tender, with years ahead of her. And she was beaming at me as I toddled to the checkout counter with an armload of books. I knew that if we had come here together to this enchanted place of all the stories in the world for us to have, she would have reminded me just about now that if she could have chosen any profession in the world, she would have been a librarian. I looked around the room at the few people scattered here and there. Some were leaning into books, and a few were just resting, having a private moment in a public place. And I felt buoyed by being here. This is why I wanted to write this book, to tell about a place I love that doesn't belong to me, but feels like it is mine, and how that feels marvelous and exceptional. All the things that are wrong in the world seem conquered by a library's simple, unspoken promise. Here I am. Please tell me your story. Here's my story. Please listen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, two things. One, the Pennsylvania Innocence Project has been involved in getting people who have been accused of arson and sent to prison for years out of prison. So. Your point is a very good one about how, how arson is a very difficult science. Yeah. Um, secondly, I have to know, did your five-year-old son find a wonderful librarian to talk to on your first visit? He did, and actually it was, it was quite remarkable. Um, she treated his questions as, as if they were the most important, serious questions that she had ever heard. And I was really moved. I mean, it was, it was such a, a remarkable thing to do to a little kid, to make him feel like his sort of fumbling, childish questions were really important. And, you know, it was a moment that made me remember what it was, what it was like for me when I was a kid going to the library. And I thought librarians to me were goddesses. You know, they just seemed like elevated people. And it was very much the same. And I, I think it, was, it made a big impression on him. Uh, I'm feeling a little guilty now. Our younger daughter chose to interview the um, paint store um, person. <laughs> um, um, but um, now that libraries are becoming less full of books, um, I just stopped upstairs at the newly renovated Lovett Library in the adult section. There's computers, but not a book. But it, um, so now that libraries are becoming less full of books, when, when they who would uh, burn libraries before they burn people, where will, where will they do their burning? Um, well, I... I guess I would begin by saying I'm not sure that libraries um, aren't still full of books. I think that they are full of books and computers and programming and all sorts of stuff. But um, I, I would m imagine that most libraries still have as many books as they did 10 years ago, if not more. Um, but I, I think that the idea of wiping away the the sort of record of a of a society is it continues. There are still, you know, up until the present day, Saddam Hussein burned libraries. Um, it happens all the time, and it continues to happen all the time. So. 
I think, unfortunately, that will continue as, as a sort of harbinger of oppression and of a gesture to say to people, we will erase you from the world's memory. I've been reading a little bit independently and uh, books, uh, one book that I read that was particularly impactful to me, besides your own, if, uh, is uh, Palaces for the People. I think the author is Eric Cronenberg, if memory serves. And uh, what I've observed, and he kind of corroborated in his research, he's a researcher too, um, is that libraries are proven themselves to be amazingly uh, resilient and adaptive. So libraries today are lending business suits to people who need to go on interviews. They're, they're lending musical instruments to talented musicians uh, who sometimes need those things. Um, uh, they're lending tools to communities so that they can get work done or even homeowners can fix their homes. Um, <clears throat> so that kind of transformation while still respecting the importance of books and everything else, it seems to me that that that's really foundational. And I know of, I can't quote the study, but uh, I remember the book referenced a um, an observation or a, uh, some aspect of his research that indicated that communities that have active libraries are actually more resilient against natural disasters. So uh, because um, it brings people out of their homes. It's a, it's a what, what he, I think he called social infrastructure. And so I wonder if in the LA library and, or other libraries you may have visited in your research, there is a question buried in there. <laughs> have, have, you, um, have you seen this transformation in libraries yourself uh, where libraries seem to be adapting to a changing world and taking on a lot more roles? Well, there's no question that um, in the last, tw you know, the advent of the internet changed libraries dramatically. Um, and even reading those bits of the, from the reference desk, you know, even that, just thinking about how that's how people used to get information was to call the library or go to the library, and now it's so easy. In fact, the librarians often Google things when people call because that's how they're finding out some of the information. Um, but libraries have adapted, they've adapted since the first library was built. I mean, the idea that libraries were one way and that they've only been one way and now they have to figure out what to do to adapt is just not true. They've always adapted, they've evolved. I mean, the fact is that libraries used to only allow men to use them no women and no children. So, you know, they've been adapting <laughs> all along and for the better. In terms of specific use, um, I think that that's a, an enormous expansion of, a, you know, certainly around this country, maybe not so much in other parts of the world, but the idea that libraries are thinking, what, what else can we do as a community hub? What are ways people get knowledge and how can we facilitate it? So um, I think that it's, a, it's an exciting time actually. And we get information now in so many different ways and libraries aim to provide it. And I think that they've been very smart in making it clear that they're not just museums of books, but something much more than that. Uh, I have a question, but first I want to just say how much I loved the book. Thank you. I, I was by how expertly you write about um, uh, visual images and architecture and contents of books and characters. You know, you brought to life so many amazing characters. So I really loved reading it. Thanks. But, yeah. My question, though, um, you did a very unusual introduction to each chapter, and I wondered if you could comment on how you did the introduction to each chapter with the, yeah, the book. Titles. Yeah, well, I, I wanted to try to make the book, the experience of reading the book, in some way replicate the experience of going to a library. And to me, one of the essential 
parts of that experience is that feeling of browsing and kind of coming across books on your way to finding the book you're looking for. So I, I just, I didn't know how I could do that in the book. And then one day, it just like a lightning bolt, it struck me that, oh, I would do it by beginning each chapter with books that they all refer to something in the chapter to come. It's not always that obvious, but they're all related. These are all books that are in the LA library currently. And, you know, choosing them was, you know, I tried to kind of thematically figure out how I, I, I wanted some variety. I wanted old books, contemporary books, books that were really obscure, books that were maybe better known. And it, it was actually really fun to do. I mean, I could have spent a really long time doing it. I had to resist because once you dive into the catalog, you know, there are two and a half million books. So it was, there were a lot of long nights where I was just sitting there going, well, what about something having to do with Missouri? And, you know, and then it was just a crazy rabbit hole. But they they were this, you know, the impulse was, how can I make it feel as if you're browsing in a library in the course of, well, and they do, they do all, I mean, none of them are random. Um, some are definitely a, a bit of a more obscure connection, but they do relate. And they're meant to sort of be, if you were looking for that, the book that was the actual chapter, what might you come across in a library? Hi there. Um, I've been waiting a long time to see you. I've been a fan for a very long time. And I'm wondering if you could say something about um, this topic within your larger body of work. Um, figures in a Mall is one of my favorite pieces of nonfiction writing. Thank you. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your interests of, as a writer have changed over time and maybe what's remained consistent. Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I, uh, thank you. <laughs> Usually when you say you want a good question, you don't get a good question, so thank you. Um, you know, I think that there are certain things that have remained very much the same. I, I've always been drawn to two kind of species of stories. One is the, the thing that's really familiar that upon second thought, I realize I don't know anything about. And the other is the thing I didn't even know existed and I'm astonished to discover it. So that those impulses have remained pretty consistent. Um, and this book actually combined them in a sense because it began with that feeling of gosh, I've never actually thought about how a library works to the shock of hearing about the fire and thinking this is an amazing thing that I didn't know existed. So I, I think that there is actually a pretty consistent through line. You know, every now and again I do a story that's, a, that's an assignment. So it's rare, but, you know, on occasion I'm doing a story not because I specifically was moved by it, but it came to me and it, it seemed interesting. But it, it, like the Tanya Harding piece, that's that version of the thing that had become very familiar. We all had heard so much about Tanya Harding, but I felt like I don't think I really know anything about this young woman and the world she emerged from. And, you know, it was sort of peeling back the obvious story and trying to figure out what what was behind it that I didn't understand. The, on a gut level though, I, I always, something will just catch my interest. And if I look at what I've written about, you know, where I've gone from writing about Saturday night to writing about an orchid thief to writing about a German Shepherd movie star, to writing about a library fire, it seems kind of random. Um, but I, I think that there is 
one or both of those impulses always attracting me to a story. And they end up, to me, feeling consistent, having that same sort of um, kind of curiosity. And, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, I want to understand the world around me, and here's something I don't understand. And it's as simple as that, a, just a, a kind of urge to understand something that I keep running across, and I, I want to know more. And then, in turn, I want to tell people about it. So that's where it goes from me wanting to learn to me wanting to tug on the, the elbow of people and go, you're not going to believe this amazing thing that I just learned. And, and that's the, the part of it that becomes, um, it goes from I want to be a student and learn something to I want to be a teacher and tell people about what I've learned. I hope that, it, I, I could talk at great length about it. Okay. Thank you.